Thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul. Whatever thou be, until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan, and I almost screamed at Lindsay. What? I was going to open up the show with like a really aggressive welcome, but then I remembered that I'd also be shocking everyone who's listening. And blowing out my eardrums? Mm-hmm. I, that's why I didn't do it. I, I thought it, I almost did it, but I pulled back at the last second. I already have so many complaints about you in my ears. Oh. So let's not add to that. <laughs> what a weird energy to start the show. Oh. I was thinking about making you angry. <laughs> you know, Hi, I'm Lindsay, and I don't like to make my co-host angry. Oh, not all, sometimes, maybe. <laughs> uh, these are the last scares we're sharing for February already. I know. Isn't that wild? Mm-hmm. Flying through 2022. Wild's my new favorite word, in case you I haven't noticed. I say wild a lot. Yeah. You do? Mm-hmm. Maybe you got it from me. Oh, no. Actually, I think I got it from Kate, Logan's wife. It's wild. Because she like, uh, you know how I'm so um, spongy? Uh-huh. You pick I'll, up people's words? I'll pick up people's words, and then I'll use them for a little bit, and then realize I'm using their words, <laughs> and then six, nine months later, I'll start mm-hmm. using that word, and be like, oh, that word feels weirdly familiar to me. <laughs> and then I won't be able to figure it out, and then one day I'm like, ooh. <laughs> Well, we got some good stories today and a couple quick announcements first. Uh, some new very cool merch in the Bad Magic store. Our very own STD Cryptid. You got to look at this thing to take it all in. Flower for head. Mm-hmm. Giant wings and talons. Giant tail, question mark. Most importantly, uh, it just looks awesome. Very different look than the other designs we've had uh, recently. Cool art on wearable fabric instead of in a frame. I am uh, excited by it. So Logan killed that. Available in both a black tee and long sleeve at badmagicmerch.com. Good job. And uh, this month's charity, again, SEO, Sponsors for Educational Opportunity, SEO's mission to create a more equitable society by closing the opportunity gap for young people from historically excluded communities. SEO annually serves 6,000 plus people across America through its various programs like SEO Scholars, an eight-year academic program that gets public high school students to and through college, which is very cool, with a 90% graduation rate, which is outstanding. Mm -hmm. And and they do a lot more. You can go to seo-usa.org to find out more. Sometimes it takes their website a little bit longer to load than most websites. I noticed that as well, yeah. So yeah, if you go and nothing's happening at first, it's... You're not wrong. Yeah. Yeah, just give it a second. Uh, We are donating $13,680 to this charity, which is 90% of the Patreon donation this month. The other 10%, 1520, uh, and this is a new thing, is going to the Cummins Family Foundation Scholarship Fund. Uh, That is a working title. It'll probably change, but the scholarship will happen. And that will be the mo- monthly percentage funding it. And by the end of the year, we hope it adds up to an amount that will really help, uh, you know, someone or multiple someones, uh, you know, have a, have a lot of help with their education. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're just going to take 10% of the monthly donation. Mm-hmm. It's getting socked away in an account as we set up the foundation, as we set up the scholarship fund. It's complicated slash not complicated, just a lot of legwork. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the goal is that we'll spend all of 22 putting money into that fund. And then these are scholarships that people will be able to apply for next year. And when it comes time to apply, we'll be sure to talk to you guys about all the qualifications. So just like, hang on to your questions. We'll get there. But we're in such early phases that, Mm -hmm. you know, we don't actually have answers for you right now. So just hold tight and we will get there. And it'll be really, really cool. And thanks to Lindsay's mom, St. Joan, for working on that. Oh, St. Joan. Yep. We hired her this year and she's crushing it. Mm -hmm. She's awesome. She's so cute. She is. Uh, How many stories do you have today, Lindsay? 25. 25? Yeah. Wow. It's a lot more than normal. Yeah. We're going to be here for a while. (laughs) (laughs) I have two. Okay. I have two. Not like last week when I said I had two, but I actually had three. Okay. I really have two. Uh, My first story. Oh, yeah. We have a Something something in a library. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to remember if we've had a haunted library story. Like, I think somewhere or like a bookstore. I have a recollection of Mm -hmm. a college student somewhere. Uh, But I was loving that because we are... Uh, re-watching Game of Thrones with Monroe. So uh, we've been in that... Uh, Season 7 when they're in the... The monastery. Samwise is uh, doing... Samwell? Samwell. 
That's right. Samwise is a character in something. Samwell is doing his uh, training to be a... Uh, Grand Maester. Maester. There we go. Grand yes. Maester. Yes. yes. Yeah. So, uh, appropriate for my life. And then the other one is Haunted Mirror mm. slash reasons not to buy things from resale stores. Oh, yeah. Like, like a Goodwill those. kind of place mm-hmm. or antique shop or whatever. That was one of the uh, in early ones. One of my favorite ones we've had was uh, the people who got the mirror from the antique shop, put it in their apartment and then started seeing things behind them. Remember how creepy that was? No. That young I've couple? I've blocked it. I've blocked Ooh. it. I just flashed on it. That was one of my favorite stories. Was it a you story or a me story? That was a, uh, a me story. Oh, that's probably why I've blocked it out. Because when, <laughs> well, when I am like putting them together and mm-hmm. editing and stuff, it stays in my brain more concretely sure. because I spend yeah. more time with the story. Makes sense. Yeah. Plus, your stories are. <laughs> Ooh, wow. Just Rest- kidding. Just kidding. Your uh, stories are great. <laughs> I have two stories uh, as well that both involve a haunted place. Both involve numerous people claiming to see or hear the same ghost or ghosts. In my opinion, the second story is scarier than the first, but they're both good. Uh, for the first shorter story, we'll head to the UK, down by Portsmouth, just north of the Isle of Wight, to explore the ghosts of Hinton Ampner. I literally don't know where any of that is. Mm, it's like southeastern uh, UK. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, mm, a story of hauntings that supposedly occurred back in the 18th century. Then we're going to go look into the crimes of Midwest serial killer Herb Baumeister, who buried numerous victims on his property in Indiana, just north of... Uh, uh, Indianapolis, ju- ju- just slightly north of Carmel. Uh, did his murders trap numerous spirits on Fox Hollow Farm, the beautiful estate where he lived and very likely murdered? Uh, so it's a little true crime haunted place mashup. And this is a creepy tale. Okay. I'm having, um, I just need to say this out loud yeah. and then I'll feel better. It's the cook from the uh, the, the cutting the culinary institute. It said herb, herbs. Oh, oh, I thought no. that's where your brain went. Sorry. Oh my God. I it's forgot like about that. Herbs. And he had like had like a like real smacky kind of mm-hmm. and a weird nasally fake laugh. Mm-hmm. And he would talk about you gotta get your herbs. Get get your herbs together. <laughs> and he would do this weird like <laughs> and you were like, what is happening right yeah. now? No, um, we cleaned up the studio and kind of just like dusted up all the shelves mm-hmm. and so things got rearranged. And the little like boy doll that is kind of Russian looking for a lack of better mm-hmm. descriptions is now up against the wall and a candle glows on him and I swear to God he keeps looking at me out of his right eye. He's not. I know it's mm, my imagination but I really just am, after the show I'm going to have to rotate him a tiny bit because between him and baby doll I just see creepy eyes over there and I am not liking it. Well you shouldn't talk about him like that in front of him. Hey guys I love you. I think you're all really beautiful dolls and it's not your fault that I feel uncomfortable around you. I don't buy it. Do you dolls. think that worked? Uh, and also, this is fun. Darren alert. <gasps> so finally, Darren makes a return. Organically came across another story with a what I think is a huge Darren. Okay. Uh, someone who just makes terrible paranormal choice after choice, needlessly remaining in harm's way instead of just getting the fuck out. Okay. Well, that is very exciting. Uh, are you ready to settle in uh, with some English history before we get into the haunted part of the yeah. first story? I've got a clear crystal worry stone. Which I love these like palm stones where the Mm-hmm. Center is sort of um, depressed. Yeah. And I, I'm not going to show you guys my hoo-ha because I'm on a skirt today. But I have on these great uh, young Frankenstein socks. Can you see? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's very cool. Madeline yeah. Kahn, young Frankenstein. Check me out. Nice. 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 Uh, all right, here we go. Okay, well, let's do it. Desi- we- oh, Sorry. But, uh, no, go ahead. Designed by Ralph Dutton, ninth and last Lord of Showbone. Uh, the Hinton Ampner Gardens, east miles east of Winchester in the UK, are thought of by many as one of the most wonderfully designed gardens of the entire 20th century. And I will have pics later. Uh, and the manor the gardens surround is, you know, a truly elegant British country home. Both are worth a visit. But more interesting and more mysterious is the property that used to exist on these grounds, uh, the structure, one that sat about 50 yards from the current building. The original Hinton Ampner was built in the 1540s in the classic Tudor style. As was the intention, the house reflected the massive wealth of the Hinton family and their influence over all those less wealthy people who lived nearby. And maybe unintentionally, it would also come to reflect its owner's secrets. By 1597, the house was under the ownership of the Stukeley family. Then in 1719, on the death of Sir Hugh Stukeley, uh, the estate passed to his daughter Mary, who married a man named Edward Stawell. When Mary died in 1740, Edward secretly took up with her much younger sister, Honoria, According to locals, the couple had a child together born out of wedlock who mysteriously disappeared soon after its birth. In the years that followed, Lord Stawell came to be widely regarded in the district as a notorious evildoer. And when Honoria died in 1754, the gossips considered her death retribution for some wicked and debauched events rumored to have taken place at Hinton Ampner. 
Though some have said that the wicked and debauched events were nothing more than your garden variety parties, as interpreted through some strict moralists of the time, others think some actual debauchery really did go on. They think people wouldn't have gossiped so much, wouldn't have attributed Honoré's death to evil doing unless something very dark had actually occurred. So what happened? Ritual sacrifice seems to be what was most whispered about. Well, uh, was that how the child had mysteriously disappeared? After Lord Stawell died from a stroke in the house's parlor a year following Honoria's death, the house did seem to quickly become quite sinister. Time now for the tale of the ghosts of Hinton Ampner. Locals now whispered in hushed tones of strange sounds heard echoing from within its walls in the dead of night, and of a figure of a gentleman in a drab-colored coat who was seen standing in the moonlight, looking out a window, his hands behind him, just like Lord Stawell had stood for so many years. By the end of the decade, it was well known that the house was haunted and locals shunned it at night. Servants made sure to leave before dark, afraid of who or what they'd come across on their way home, more afraid of what they would encounter if they chose to stay inside the home after the sun went down. Amid all these rumors, the unfortunate Ricketts family would soon find themselves living in this supposedly very haunted house. The Ricketts family moved into Hinton Ampner in January of 1765, having rented the property from Lady Stawell. Almost immediately after settling in, they heard the sound of doors slamming at night, which Mr. Ricketts initially feared was caused by irregular behavior of the servants. When he could find no proof of the servants acting irregularly, he became convinced that some of the local villagers had acquired spare keys to the house, and Mr. Ricketts changed all the locks. But the hard-to-explain noises continued. And then at least twice, servants reported seeing that same male figure in a drab-colored coat, the one locals had reported seen standing in the window prior, the rumored ghost of Lord Stawell. And on other occasions, servants sitting in the kitchen claimed to see a tall woman in a dark silk dress rush through the room on more than one occasion. The servants would hurry to attend to these mysterious phantoms, thinking at first that there were some wealthy guests of the Ricketts, only to find that the people had suddenly vanished. In 1769, Mr. Ricketts had to leave his family in, at Hinton while he attended to his property in Jamaica. Not long after, Mrs. Ricketts wrote that she plainly heard the footsteps of a man with plodding step walking towards the foot of my bed. She leapt out of bed, ran into the adjoining nursery, returning with a nursemaid and a light. A search revealed nothing. When she went back to bed, Mrs. Ricketts could now hear what sounded to her like a woman's skirt rustling just beyond in the darkness. And it wasn't just Mrs. Ricketts who was experiencing this haunting. Other people were hearing strange noises as well. Hinton's occupants often heard a hollow murmuring that seemed to possess the whole house. Even when there was no wind outside, even when the weather was calm and still, they could still hear this odd, unsettling, hollow murmuring. And there was additional paranormal activity reported. One night, the front door was heard to be slammed so violently that it shook Mary's room above. Yet when quickly inspected after this disturbance, the door was found to be locked and bolted as usual. Over time, these disturbances became intolerable. Mary would soon write in her diary, They began before I went to bed, and were heard till after broad day in the morning. A shrill female voice would begin, and then two others with a man-like tone seemed to join in the discourse. Though this conversation sounded as if it was close to me, I never could distinguish words. Mary described how one night she heard the most loud, deep, tremendous noise, which seemed to rush and fall with infinite velocity and force on the lobby floor followed by a shrill and dreadful shriek, repeated three or four times before the sound grew fainter, as if descending, she wrote, into the earth. Although she had been reluctant to mention these experiences to anyone at first, only mentioning them in her diary, their effect on her mental and even physical health, and the continued absence of her husband eventually persuaded her to confide it to her brother, Admiral Jervis. Jervis, along with his friend, Captain Luttrell, set out one night to confront whatever entities might be roaming the house maybe thinking mistakenly that Mrs. Ricketts was imagining the entire thing, that if they sat through the night and told her they hadn't seen anything, the power of suggestion would make Mrs. Ricketts think that everything was fine. They explored every room, examined every possible hiding place, then armed themselves with pistols and settled down to watch and to wait. Moments later, sure enough, they heard the sound of dreadful groans, and Captain Jervis felt something flit past him in the darkness. The sounds continued and appeared to be coming from the floor directly above them, so the two men rushed upstairs and searched the entire floor, but again, nothing turned up. The next morning, Captain Jervis declared that the house was an unfit residence for any human being, 
He also refused to talk about exactly what it was he had seen rush past him in the shadows during his long night-keeping watch, or reveal what he'd heard mumbled in the darkness around him. Whatever it was, it was clear that the experience had thoroughly terrified him. Wanting a second opinion, Mrs. Ricketts turned now to the public to help her understand what was happening inside her home. She offered a reward of £100 to anyone who could find an explanation for the sounds, but no one could. Despite that £100 reward, a lot of money at the time, no earthly explanation was ever found. Shortly afterwards, maybe thinking that the house's mysteries were too deep to ever truly uncover, Mrs. Ricketts and her children moved out. Roughly two decades later, the mystery Mrs. Ricketts searched for may have been found. When the house was demolished in 1793 to make way for the new massive Georgian manor that sits on the grounds today, workmen reportedly discovered a small wooden box under some floorboards containing a small skull. And everyone remembered how Lord Stawell's illegitimate child with his sister-in-law had mysteriously disappeared all those decades before. Was that why spirits lingered around the house? Were they unable to move into the afterlife after they'd committed such a horrible deed in this world? These days, the old haunted structure no longer exists. The current Hinton Ampner House was built in 1793, remodeled extensively in 1867, and no one has reported seeing Lord Stawell or any mysterious murmuring on the property for over 200 years. It's good to know that if you sleep with my sister-in-law and have a baby with Rachel, mm -hmm. that I can make sure that you're haunted for the rest of your life. I have to kill the baby, though. I have to, I have to sleep with Rachel. We don't know. We have to have a baby, kill the baby, Can't put the head in a box, and bury it under the floorboards. Right. Well, you're a monster. Oh, okay. Well, well, There's if, that. If you sleep with Rachel, you're a monster. <laughs> so I, I can make sure that you're messed up for the rest of your life. You don't think Rachel's sexy? Oh, she's hot. Then what's the problem? You're right. <laughs> I should get on board. <laughs> uh, you should do it quick before they get married. Okay. She's not really my sister-in-law yet. I'll talk to Jason about it. I'm, uh, sure, I'm sure he's all for it. <laughs> And this is, his, this is his birthday. So this is his birthday oh. episode. What a gift. Okay. What okay. a gift. Well, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, this first picture is a shot of uh, part of the Hinton, or oh my God, Hinton Ampner Garden. What is what is Ampner? I, I think, did I miss that? Hinton I got, but Ampner. It's just the name of the manor, but I don't know where that word comes from, okay. actually. I don't I know, know if it's if like it... a location. Because um, it's, it's kind of out in the country. It's a country state. Mm -hmm. It's not like in a town, but that's right. just what it's called. But I don't know where the uh, that word comes from, actually. I didn't know if you were going to say like, oh, an Ampner is a blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't okay. get that either. Well, it's stunning. And one of the things that I love most in life is a gorgeous garden like that. And England has such good weather. I mean, the UK, I know. because of all the rain and the overcast days, and they got good soil. Yeah. And just a, a culture that has really embraced for a long time the gardening. Um, beautiful like I don't even care I, normally I don't give a shit about a garden no please you know I hate to garden right. like I am we have no living things yeah. in our yard that require <laughs> me doing anything to right. make them live but I've been but over in the UK I, I've been like oh wow like I that know. is impressive Um, here's another picture Uh, this is the current home that sits in front of the garden god damn I know that big reflective pond the whole thing. That's ah, an amazing. Yeah, it's an amazing estate. But at night. Well, here, and, and this next one is a picture of the grounds at night. I mean, obviously, I'm already scared. Obviously, it's going to be spookier. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, that big, like, very phallic shadow on um, that is reflecting onto it. What's that? What oh, vines. Vines going up. Oh yeah, vines. Yeah. yeah vines going up. Really. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Ah, very cool. That's also been photoshopped. Yeah, it's been filled. Yeah, where they've run filters to it yeah. to make it look like that. But still, a lot of, so, lot of contrast, a lot of, what sharpness playing around with it and stuff. That's scary. Uh, so now we need to head to uh, the rare scared to death story. If you're, unless you have questions um, that involves true crime. Oh, I wanted to say something wildly inappropriate. <laughs> Do it. Is that okay? Of so, course it is. So one person's name, her name was Honoria. Yeah. And I was like, God, you're so lucky. Like Honoria. Yep. I was like, if you were named Honoria in 2022, you would be. <laughs> Crucified. Honoria, gonorrhea. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Di mm -hmm. Honoria, diarrhea. Like there were so many. I was like, oh, this is yeah, terrible. If you would have grown up with that name in like the seventies or eighties, or today, or just I think like kids are a lot nicer today. Uh, no, because uh, our kids get ridiculed for their last name. So, mm. okay, they still Whoop. do. Sorry, a big swallow know, on Mike. I know, I know. I don't have a mute button on my side. It's a real problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Joe, we gotta help him. <laughs> uh, I no, guarantee we it would still happen. <laughs> He only has so many hands over there. <laughs> True, uh, and I'm holding the book, too. Yeah. I mean, I've got a lot of hands. Sorry. Uh, no, Monroe, like, recently, I forget what got said, that she said something like, oh, yeah, now she's starting to get it. You know, Kyler got it a couple uh, years okay. ago. I think it's like once kids kind of go through, like, the um, the sex talk at yeah. school, and then everybody kind of hits puberty, and it's like, oh, okay. 
Uh, Here it comes. Uh, Honoria Cummins. Oh, my God. Honoria Cummins. That'd be a tough one. Yeah. That would be rough. Do you have any uh, horror-related thoughts, or do you want to... No, I just thought that that was... <laughs> <laughs> no, that was my big takeaway. Okay. Well, this, I, I this, couldn't stop thinking about it. <laughs> uh, I like that story, but it was an appetizer for this next one that is, uh, this is dark. Was it a little snack? It was. Okay. It was. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. So, we're, yeah, we're going to go where true crime meets the paranormal. Um, we're going to head back across the Atlantic to Indiana. Quite a bit of time to settle in before we make it to the paranormal parts of the story. But, uh, but the setup is scarier than most uh, since it involves, you know, the true crime story of a serial killer. Between 1980 and 1991, many members of the gay community of Indianapolis were living in fear of a serial killer. Body after body was turning up on the side of I-70. Young gay men were being murdered and law enforcement had no suspects. Then one day, these bodies stopped being found. The police would later learn that this sudden lack of corpses would coincide with Herb Baumeister and his wife moving themselves and their four children to Fox Hollow Farm, an 18-acre property in Westfield, Indiana, an outer suburb of Indianapolis, just north of Carmel. Herbert and his wife, Julie, had been married since 1971. She was a teacher, and the couple were making good money from the two Save-A-Lot thrift stores they owned. Hmm. Both came from seemingly typical middle-class backgrounds, but Herb's childhood was not typical. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia as a teenager, hmm. a condition that his parents, after his diagnosis, seemed to have largely ignored, as if it was just going to go away on its own. Uh, okay. Young Herb was a strange kid who needed help he didn't get. He once placed a dead crow on his teacher's desk. He thought it would be funny. She didn't. He had a strange fascination with urine, constantly asking his classmates if they drank their own urine or what it tasted like. Herb also had a fascination with and simultaneous hatred of uh, gay men that would lead to so much tragedy once he became an adult. Before he'd bought those Save-A-Lot thrift stores, Herb didn't appear to be on a path towards the kind of financial success that would allow him to buy a beautiful 18-acre estate. He'd had trouble holding down jobs, had been fired several times, once fired for sending Christmas cards to colleagues with sexually explicit images depicting men in drag on them, uh, fired from another job for urinating on a letter addressed to the local mayor. Oh, my God. By the time uh, Baumeister's uh, family moved to Fox Hollow, Fox Hollow, uh, he seemed to be on the straight and narrow. He was a normal-seeming, you know, father of a respectable middle-class family, a family that had just moved into a large, beautiful Tudor-style house on a huge piece of property. No one had any idea that those bodies that had been found along I-70 were his murder victims. And no one had any idea that the reason those bodies stopped showing up was because he had started burying the remains of recent victims on his new, large, wooded property. In 1994, Herb's teenage son discovered a human skeleton on the family property. He told his mom, Julie, about it. Together, she and her son investigated, found a whole pile of bones in the woods on their property not far from the house. Holy shit. Julie confronted her husband, Herb, about it that night. He said the skeleton was a cadaver that his father, an an anesthesiologist, had once used for practice. And that the other bones belonged to his father as well. Julie didn't believe him. How could she have? That's not a well-thought-out lie. Why would Herb take a skeleton his father had once used and randomly hide it out in the woods by their house? Julie was suspicious that something nefarious was going on, but she had no idea where the skeleton had really come from, and Herb talked her into not reporting it to the police. Oh, my God. Then in November of 1995, a young local man came forward about a 1992 encounter he'd had in Indy with a dangerous man. He'd met a man who'd introduced himself as Brian Smart at a downtown gay bar, and Brian had invited the young man back to his house. Then, while the two were swimming in his indoor pool, he said that Brian had tried to strangle him. But he didn't report the incident when it happened. For the next three years, he never saw this guy again, but then Brian returned to the same gay bar in 1995, and this time the young man took down his license plate number, smart, gave it to the police. The police investigated, discovered that the car was registered to, of course, Herb Baumeister. The police suspected that if he'd attempted to kill one man, he may have attempted to kill others, that he may have been successful at killing others. So the police approached Herb, asked him about some missing person cases, and then suspiciously, he refused to allow them to search his house or property. Sadly, they didn't have enough evidence on him to get a search warrant at that time. But then just the following year, June of 1996, (laughs) while in the midst of a messy divorce, his soon-to-be ex-wife, Julie, did allow detectives onto the property to search for human remains while Herb was out of town. Julie was divorcing Herb partially because of his increasingly erratic mood swings and strange behavior. Again, he had untreated schizophrenia. Also because of that pile of bones she had found. 
And now her husband was a suspect in several disappearances, and she knew he'd refused to allow the police to search their property in the past. She was now certain that Herb was the killer they were looking for and that those bones belonged to some missing victims. She asked her divorce lawyer to contact the sheriff's office to ask them to conduct a search. What they'd find was even worse than she'd imagined. The police found not just the remains of one person or two, they found literally hundreds of human bones scattered around the woods surrounding she and Herb's house. They found more bones in a nearby creek on their property. Holy shit. Most of the bones were damaged by animals or seemed to have been burned. Many were still intact. There were enough bones for the police, uh, um, or there was enough bones that the police estimated they belonged to at least 11 victims, possibly many more than that. It was impossible to identify all of Herb's victims, but several missing men were now finally located. Herb got wind of the property search while out of town, fled to Canada. Once across the border, he must have realized there was no escaping punishment for what he'd done, and he shot himself in the head and died on July 3rd, 1996. Herb left a suicide note, but made no mention of the dead men. In June of 1999, the police found nine more victims in streams along I-70. All are believed to have been killed by Herb Baumeister. In total, the police believe that Herb killed at least 21 men and teenage boys. They think he picked up most of them from gay bars in Indianapolis. And of the identified remains, strangulation was determined to be their primary cause of death. No trial would ever take place, so he is listed as a suspected serial killer online, but everybody familiar with the case knows that he did it. Uh, with Herb dead, the case of a serial killer had been closed, and a new haunting seems to have been opened. Some now firmly believe that the spirits of some of his victims, and perhaps the spirit of Herb himself, are not resting in peace and still reside on Herb's old property. Time now for the tale of the haunting of Fox Hollow Farm. In May of 2009, Robert and Vicki Graves purchased the Fox Hollow Farm property. The house was originally listed at $2.8 million. They paid... 987000 Oh, boy. Big red flag. Big red flag. Some of this price drop can be attributed to the real estate crash of 2008, but not all of it. The property's history surely had a lot to do with it not selling for anywhere near the original asking price. The house had been remodeled since the days of Herb Baumeister and now boasted nine bathrooms and a library. Still had that indoor pool. The couple were excited to move into the house they thought would be the perfect home for themselves and their two young boys for many, many years to come. Lots of land around it. It was a dream house. And as with so many stories like this we tell here, you know, it was pretty dreamy in the beginning. There weren't any initial signs that anything supernatural was lurking in the house for the first few months. Well, not really. There was one strange incident. One day while Vicky was vacuuming, halfway through cleaning the hallway, the vacuum stopped working. Vicky spun around, saw the plug had fallen out of the outlet. She shrugged it off, convinced herself that she must have just pulled on the cord too hard. Happens all the time. But then while she vacuumed this one hallway, uh, it happened again and again and again. This was hardly a terrifying sign of the paranormal, just something that gave her a pause and weirded her out a bit. Uh, but then when she noticed nothing else happened in the weeks that followed, no, she forgot about it and didn't think about it again until Joe LeBlanc moved in. Joe was a friend of Robert's who'd found himself in need of a place to stay. And he unknowingly moved into what was once Herb Baumeister's living quarters, now in an, an apartment above the garage. And Joe's moving in seems to have awakened something. Seemed to have triggered uh, the resident ghosts into making their presence uh, undeniably known. They became very active. The very first night Joe moved in, uh, he had a terrible nightmare. He couldn't remember what or who, but he knew something evil had been chasing him through the woods just past the house. The dream was so vivid that Joe's adrenaline surged as soon as he woke up and he leapt out of bed, still running, and hit his head against the door. Same day, uh, Robert was on a ladder, painting the house, when he heard his wife urgently shout for his attention. Robert, there's someone here! Someone's in the woods! Robert climbed down, initially not alarmed. He was already getting used to trespassers at their new house. So far, it had just been thrill-seeking kids looking for places where bodies had been buried or for ghosts. Robert did worry, though, that one of these times the trespasser would be someone who might try to break into the house. Due to that concern, Robert now had his shotgun nearby. By the time he retrieved his weapon, Vicky's face was white as a sheet. She stood frozen to the spot where she'd seen the trespasser still staring out that window. And then she told Robert that there wasn't an intruder after all, not a living one anyway. Vicky said she had clearly seen a young man in a red shirt running through the woods, terrified of whatever was chasing him. And as he passed a tree, Vicky saw that he impossibly had no legs. Oh my God. And then a second later, he just vanished into thin air. The very next day, Joe LeBlanc learned that the nightmare he'd had was not a one-off. He started experiencing a nightly occurrence that will prevent him from getting a good night's sleep for months. Night after night, at 3 a.m., Joe would hear a loud knocking at the door of his apartment. 
The first time it happened, Fred, his usually very relaxed and friendly dog, was baring his teeth and growling at the door. He clearly didn't like whoever or whatever was on the other side. The knock then came again, louder this time. Joe quickly went to answer the door, thinking that maybe Robert or Vicky had lost their keys or needed his help with something. No one was outside. But Frank was still growling, or, uh, wait, I think it's Fred. Fred. Yeah, Fred was still growling and agitated and took a while to calm down. Soon, Robert will decide to put security cameras around the house and grounds, thinking maybe the family was being tormented by some unidentified trespasser, still hopeful that the problem was human in nature. But the 3 a.m. knocking continued. Night after night, Joe jumped out of bed, flung the door open, only to find no one. Then about a month into his stay, Joe had an even more intense paranormal experience. He was taking Fred for a nightly walk around the grounds. They'd made it to the outskirts of the woods when Fred suddenly became extremely agitated. He started growling and snarling, and then very unlike him, he took off, ignoring Joe's commands for him to stop, and he ran out into the woods. Joe chased after him, wondering just what had gotten into his well-trained, normally would never do that companion. And then he saw something out of the corner of his eye. A man was running through the woods with a look of fear on his face. He seemed to be definitely running away from something or from somebody. Joe was about to call out to the man to see if he needed help. When his mouth dropped, he saw, just as Vicky had seen before, that the man had no legs. The man sped past a tree, then vanished as quickly as he'd appeared, disappearing into nothing. Joe then retrieved Fred, ran back to the house to tell Robert and Vicky about his experience. They would take a different route for their nightly walks from that point forward. In the weeks that followed, the nightly knocking on Joe's door became louder, more demanding. Joe continued to try to determine if a living person could somehow be behind it all. He quickly answered the door. He called for the trespasser to identify themselves. He even inspected the area around his apartment every night. No one was ever there. Then one night, the knocking was so frantic, it felt like the whole room was shaking. Fred had positioned himself under the bed, wouldn't come out. Joe shouted, who's there? I have a gun. The knocking grew louder, still louder, louder, until eventually the door flung open. There was a young man on the other side who now stepped through the door frame, stood still, a look of absolute terror on his face. Joe and the man stood staring at each other after he popped out of bed, equal expressions of horror on their faces. Then with a crash, the door violently slammed shut again. When Joe opened it a moment later, there was no young man. <sighs> These events led Robert and Vicky to research the case of her Baumeister. They read articles, watched news reports, even talked to local police. They started to wonder if the spirits of some of his victims were now stuck haunting their property. Then they became convinced that the, uh, became convinced this was the case when one night Joe, Vicky, and Robert were watching some old news footage, and Joe just about jumped out of his seat yelling, Oh my God, that's him. That's the man who showed up at my door. The man who Joe saw was clearly one of the young men who'd been reported missing. Unfortunately, figuring out uh, who one of the spirits was did not put an end to the haunting on the property. Things actually got worse after Joe identified this nightly visitor. One night shortly after figuring out who was knocking on his door, Joe was enjoying a swim in the, uh, in the pool. Oh, dear. He was paddling around, enjoying the feel of the warm water on his skin when all of the lights flickered out. Almost simultaneously, Joe felt an invisible force grab around his neck and squeeze while trying to push him under the water. He fought against it with everything he could, eventually freed himself. Joe, now absolutely terrified, climbed out of the pool, ran back to the apartment without even getting changed. He was absolutely convinced he had just met the ghost of her Baumeister and that the apparition had literally tried to kill him. He surmised that now that he knew about Herb, Herb's ghost wanted him dead. But after this near drowning, Joe does not go find a new place to live. Oh, uh... Is he a Darren? I don't know what his financial situation was, but he didn't own this place. He wasn't stuck with a mortgage from the sound of things. Uh, reading various articles, I doubt he was even in a lease. Why didn't he get the fuck out? Was he a glutton for paranormal punishment? Another evening after this, Joe is sitting at his desk when he hears an unusual scraping sound. He goes to investigate the apartment, finds that all the knives from the wooden block in the kitchen had been removed and arranged in the sink. And then he sees that knife marks appeared in the wall as if the knives had been stuck in the wall. Joe is certain those marks were not there before, so now a spirit is throwing knives around where he is living, a spirit he thinks wants to kill him, but still he stays. Joe had seen a few ghost hunting shows before, now decides to attempt his own EVP. Oh dear. Electronic voice phenomena. A session using an old tape recorder. He asks a few questions, including who was present in the apartment. While he was asking, doesn't hear anything speak back to him. But when he listens to the tape later that night, he hears a very clear male voice respond, the married one. Right or wrong, Joe is now adamant that this is the voice of the ghost of Earp. 
And he thinks, because he's a relatively young single man, that Herb has picked him out as his next victim. But still, he doesn't leave. The last straw for Joe would be seen shadow people. Following the EVP session, now, whenever he's outside on the property near the woods where the bones have been discovered at night, he starts seeing dark, human-like figures darting around. They have no facial features, just thick black masses, but he can feel them watching him. Joe finally decides that he's in too much danger to stay. He wonders if these figures are not just ghosts, but perhaps something else, something demonic, and he moves out. After Joe leaves, the paranormal activity decreases but doesn't go away. Robert and Vicky are still uncomfortable enough with unexplainable events that keep occurring that they accept the offers of some ghost hunting teams to come and investigate their property. They were usually very private people, didn't like to attract attention, but they decided that if someone could perhaps help these spirits move on, then they could finally have some peace and not have to move out of the dream home they'd bought for the bargain price. Ghost Adventures was the first to investigate the property. Host Zach Baggins would say that he felt Robert had a deep connection with Herb that was keeping him there. Creepy. What a terrible person to have a connection with. The investigation was considered a mild success, with the most notable events being a few successful EVP recordings, picking up a clear male voice, saying Herb did it, and help. But when the investigation is over, the property is just as haunted as ever. They didn't help get any of the spirits out. Uh, the Graves, weirdly perfect last name for the story, by the way, uh, now invited Richard Estep and his team to investigate. Richard and his team investigate the farm twice, come to a different conclusion than the Ghost Adventures crew had arrived at. Richard believed that Joe, not Robert, was the one with the connection to Herb's spirit, and that he was some sort of catalyst for all the recent paranormal activity. This became evident to Richard after a slow first day of investigation. As soon as Richard invited Joe back to the farm, activity started to pick up immediately. His team suddenly experienced the feeling of being poked, prodded, they felt invisible hands grab them in various places. They also found, this is terrifying, an underground tunnel in the woods with the word bones carved into the wall. After leaving Fox Hollow for the first time, Richard and his team consulted a Catholic priest, invited a psychic as well named Brian Sanders to come along for the next investigation. The priest claimed that the farm was not haunted by Herb at all, but by an inhuman demonic entity pretending to be Herb. Psychic Brian was of the opinion that seven entities haunted the farm. Herb, four of his victims, a Native American spirit, and an elemental. And he claimed that the investigations were causing the spirits to become upset and the reason for their unrest. The second investigation turned up more solid proof of the paranormal. This team caught an apparition uh, on one of the monitors coming out of Joe's old closet. Also came to the conclusion that the spirits were either not willing or could not communicate in a way that would allow the team to help them move on. And the team finished their investigation by recommending to the graves that Joe stay away from their property forever. And that if they wanted to keep living there, they should conduct further investigate, or they should not conduct further investigations. Hope the spirits will settle back down and leave them be. Robert and Vicky took the advice. They refused to allow any more people to investigate paranormal activity on their farm for many years. With Joe gone, the paranormal activity, though still present, was apparently now mild and benign. The family still lives there today. As far as I know, no spirit has returned to knock on any doors or attempt to drown anyone in the family's swimming pool. They're Darren's as well. I know, because that's some insane activity. That's insane. And also, we know that money is not an issue if they're buying a million-dollar property that was originally 2.5. Yeah, they could probably very likely turn a really good profit on profit on it. Yeah. 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 Ugh. Okay. Joe was making me crazy. I mean, for me, the, the reason I wanted to label him as a Darren, or did label him as a Darren, was after the pool incident, which, which followed... Uh, a few months right. of nightly knocking and being terrified. So if you're like, you're having nightmares, some spirit is waking up night after night. You're seeing weird shit in the woods. Well, and that and that and tries to kill you. And the spirit comes through his door. Right, comes through his door. I love and the knives, and he yeah. still stays. I love that it's the shadow people that send him over the edge. It's like that's the thing. That's the thing that made you leave. Not the knives. Not the almost being drowned with the Dude. lights going out. Not with some thing yep. coming into your apartment. Fucking shadow people. The pool. The pool. Oh my God. I mean, it's like something tried. If you're claiming something just tried to drown you. Right. And you're like, oh, no, I'll just hang around. Yep. And you do this research and you think like, oh, that's Herb's spirit. And he wants me to be his next victim. And you're like, I'll ah, just go to bed on the property. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. I'll, me me I'll and Fred will be okay. Oh, my gosh. What an idiot. Yeah. He seems like a real idiot in the story. He was an idiot. I also wonder, mm -hmm. and I don't know. I mean, you didn't touch on this. And I don't know that it was revealed anywhere in your research. But yeah. I wonder if Joe was gay. Maybe not oh, uh, maybe not know. out, 
But mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because if that was Darren, uh, Darren, if that, that was, was Herb's, uh, that was his MO type for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes me wonder, like, oh, or was it just that Joe was yeah. a single guy, and so mm-hmm. in in Herb's like spirit side, he can't mm-hmm. differentiate heterosexual people from not. Right, so maybe like, he, maybe he had a look that attracted him to him. Right, something. like maybe he was like more effeminate looking, or maybe or he was just like non-binary. A bear, or, who knows? He could have been whatever whatever Herb's preference was. Cause right. Because I, I did I didn't compare a like a compilation of like uh like photos of his victims. Yeah. Compared to what Joe looked like, because I don't I don't I couldn't find a photo of Joe mm. in articles about it. There was like photos of the graves, yeah. like some of them, and obviously there's a lot of information about Herb specifically and. Uh, the, the, cr- the true crime side of things. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know if that Joe guy happened to look like the victim. And I don't know if he had a specific type. Right, or if it was just gay men. Right. I and don't know we- how the look factor into it. Okay, two questions that you probably don't know the answers to, yeah. but I'm going to ask anyways because they're in my mind. W- is there any chance that Herb himself was gay or bisexual? Like, why gay men? Yes. There is, it is a strong assumption that he was not comfortable with his sexuality. He was, was closeted. Because there was, and I don't have the number. I think I do remember. This is a random. De- but I remember, like, you know, I didn't focus heavy, heavy on the true crime side since that's not what we do here. But I did right. have that thought of, like, oh, this could be a time suck episode. Yeah. But I'm 99%, I apologize if I get this wrong, but I'm 99.9% certain this is right for this case, that there was, in an article I read, his wife, after all this was done, said, because it stuck with me because it's such an odd number, that over the course of their marriage, they had sex six times. And a couple of those times, like, she got pregnant. So clearly, yeah. there was some sexual dysfunction going on. And you combine that with his anger and hatred yeah. towards his men. And he's inviting them over, like, you know, there's a... Uh, in a romantic way. Right. It, there's the connotation that, like, come over and hook up. Yeah, and, and there probably was hookups, I would have yeah. to assume. You know, it could, it could be one of those things, just from studying so much true crime before, where uh, these people who have this, uh, maybe there was um, uh, a lot of homophobia in his upbringing, mm-hmm. and he just wasn't comfortable with who he was, mm-hmm. and then he brings people home, they start to hook up, he feels intense guilt and right. shame. yeah projects that onto them right and that and that turns into rage and murder God, that's so which, which sad. is sadly not a unique uh mo for you know certain killers yeah and my other question mm. that again if you because this is on the true crime side yeah do we know where julie and julian herb's children are now uh no and i didn't look into that though okay, okay. but i will say just from doing i mean it, i would change my name i would move well, name changes yeah. like the whole thing and there is a lot of that just from, again, doing like so many true crime episodes on Time Suck. That's very common. Are you trying to promote your show, Time Suck? <laughs> no. But it's very common. It's very common for, you know, once these people are arrested, yeah. for the family to get real quiet, mm-hmm. leave the area, and quite often change their name. And I can't blame them. No. I mean, if I put myself into Julie's shoes, mm-hmm. I need so much therapy. Yep. And you want to protect your children yeah, I need, from Oh, my the God. Taunts. I need so much EMDR therapy. I need so much like... DMT yeah. shrooms, like just like <laughs> new neural pathways that mm-hmm. disconnect me from mm-hmm. that. And then, yeah, I'm changing our name and I'm putting my kids into therapy. Yep. I mean, it's just so fucked up. Yeah, hopefully they Be- Because left. as a kid, yeah. wouldn't like, there are so many things that are hereditary in our right. lives and me- mental illness can be hereditary, all of that. Like, yeah. if I'm Julie and I'm Julie and Herb's kids, I'm worried all the time that those kids are suddenly going to have a, a, a moment of. Mm-hmm. Of snapping. When, because schizophrenia in men, that's usually like the onset, right? Is in the teen years? No, no, I think it's kind of, ri- well, I, I, you know what? I can't, it's been so long since I looked into that specifically, but I know that there can be onset. I always thought it was in your late 20s to mid 30s. Oh, I thought was, it was late teens to mid 20s. You might be right, though. You might be right. And there's, you know, I think there's different forms and, but, 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 I, but I know that does happen a lot. Mm-hmm. If, if, if it's not the most common, I know it's very common for onset to happen, you know, uh, in your teen years. Yeah, yeah, in your younger years. Yeah, I mean, just so fucking sad and so mm-hmm. sad that it was untreated. And I wonder if Julie knew that he was schizophrenic since it went no, undiagnosed no. and untreated. I would imagine. Well, she might have just thought he was like an odd guy, but maybe she kind of liked right. that. Maybe she enjoyed someone who was, you know, hard to get, kind of like a little emotionally aloof and... Mm-hmm. Ugh. People make strange romantic choices all the time. Oh my God. Uh, okay, I had this weird, weird thought like the spirit running through the woods. Mm-hmm. I, back to Game of Thrones, I immediately <laughs> flashed on Ramsey Bolton and that fucked up game he would play where he would send yep. people mm-hmm. running into the woods and then send his and dogs mm-hmm. and, and he himself would go out and hunt them. And I just thought, like, oh my God, Herb 
that's probably what he like they either his victims were trying to get away and running through the yeah. woods or he was like go ahead and then going after them yeah i don't know too that's much like robert hansen another killer but the butcher baker he, he would do that to people oh yeah uh also it got very cold in here during that story did you feel that uh, no, but I, I get the chills. I kept getting really, really, really cold. When I was working on that one, uh, I, I was working on it alone, you know, like in the house in a little bit, and I kept getting, uh, yeah, like cold. Well, it's a dark story. It's a dark story, both paranormally and on the mm -hmm. true crime side. It's really sad. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to me, like the saddest part, well, two sad parts, is like the, that Herb was never treated for his mental illness. Yeah. That, that is just so awful because yeah. it's not like I, I highly doubt that he never went to a doctor for other things like the flu or sure, sure, right sure. so it's just like so sad mm -hmm. that we're just so ignorant to various mental illness things or that we're so ashamed of it the stigma around it it's like it's not to say that he would have been okay but he at least could have been medicated and I, it just feels like this all could have been prevented yeah so there's that part that's really sad and then on the paranormal side what makes me so sad is it's like did, did no one ever it sounds like they never had anybody come in and try and like actually cleanse the house based on mm. those investigators coming saying oh just kind of ignore it which is fucking stupid <laughs> i cannot well, believe second, that that, that was team. advice that second team yeah. yeah i'm like what are you talking about get a spiritual healer in there clear the energy give all those spirits including herb the ability to move on to the other side let them go release them like smoke cleanse it you could plant crystals all the way around the perimeter of the house like <laughs> you could have made that no. home a, a, like better you know mm -hmm. i just feel bad for those people that died in horrific ways and i wonder if and i know you didn't touch on this and you probably don't know but like the bodies that they found i wonder if they were ever able to contact or the bones that they found contact the families and say like hey you know, we found your son. We found. I think so. I think so. I mean, yeah, like the identity. I was looking for closure. Yes, some of the some of the victims were. I mean, I'm sure they were able to notify. You know, uh, uh, the you know next of kin. I hope so. But there were a lot of. Um, they did, they were not able to identify all the remains. So, I, there, so there's and then there's a large pool of missing people. Mm -hmm. So you can just kind of speculate was perhaps you know this missing person was that one of their bones? But they did not identify all of the remains. And I would bet the people who are unidentified mm. are the people haunting the property. Yeah, I don't know. And they just want to be. You know, it's like, uh, what is it, Teresita? Oh, Teresita Bassa? Bassa. I was mm -hmm. going to say Teresita Bonita, and I knew that wasn't right. Chiquita but like, Bonita? Ch Chiquita Banana. Um, you know that they just want to, like, they want it solved. They want to go home. Mm-hmm. Yep. Ah, that was fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah, Do you have pictures or no? Yeah, I, I do. Sorry, yeah. we just talked a lot. <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, the first story was, um, uh, this is, or first picture, sorry, is uh, Herb. So this is Herb Baumeister. He looks a little bit like Ted, like Hope and Ted. Oh my God, he does. He does. A uh, friend we know. Uh, this next one is Fox Hollow Farm. So, you know, pretty, uh, it's a, it's been it's been cut up since like there's uh, the property is no longer 18 acres. Oh, it's been you know, parceled out. Yeah, you know, which is great financial strategy, but um, but it still has a lot of the woods around. This next one is um, a begin the beginning of a large patch of woods near the farm. <laughs> and then I mean, 18 acres is a big piece of land. That's so there was a lot, lot of woods of around there. Yeah. Uh, and then this last one is that ghost hunter of the second team that Richard Estep conducting an EVP session in that pool. Indoor where, pools, man. Does anybody really have those anymore? Um, I'm sure. I mean, very rich people, but like yeah. indoor pool. All mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll take an indoor pool. Yeah. If you got money in Indianapolis, I mean, it's, it gets pretty cold there in the winter. It's about like here. Can, can I have an indoor pool? No, we don't have the room. We don't have the property size. Yes, we do. No, we don't. We don't need a garage. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> you're the one who uses it. So Ew. it's going to affect you. I probably can't store stuff in there anymore. Then. <laughs> that's a wild story. I feel like that's really going to linger in my head because it just feels, um, it's so plausible, right? I mean, there's all kinds of like unsolved murders mm, all the time. Mm -hmm. And then years later, it's like, oh my God, that was actually part of a string of murders and yeah. it all comes out later. And uh, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what, what it is. It's just very sticky. Mm -hmm. mm -mm, mm -mm. Do, you, do you want to tell me about your squish guy this week? I got, I got uh, Dracula. So you, so. you don't have Frankenstein because it kind of would have like gone with my socks. Oh yeah. You should have thought about that. Oh, man, I should have. I know. He's uh, cute. <laughs> does he smell? Is he scented? He is. <gasps> what does he smell like? I don't know. I have a hard time identifying scents. Oh, okay. Probably like fake chocolate. Because <laughs> I, I feel like that's kind of a yeah. plasticky smell. Uh, okay. Do you want to go to a library? Mm -hmm, I, I do. I love libraries. Me too. You do? Mm, I've told you that before. I used to work at one. Oh, when you were in college, right? Mm -hmm. That's funny. I made a note to ask that 
of you because this story is about a college kid working in their college library. Okay. Well, so, could have been me. Is this your story? It's my story. My, what do you Back have at a, the Foley Center. Do you have a favorite library that you've ever been in? Mm, no, I like the Santa Monica Library a lot. Uh, but no, I don't have like one that, one that really sticks out. Mm-hmm. I mean, I did like the Foley one that I was at, you know, that's at Gonzaga. Yeah. Very nice library. Have you ever been in the, were you ever in the um, Central Library in L.A.? No. Oh, in downtown L.A., it's like this uh, 1920s uh, Art Deco building. It is so cool. And oh, it is very cool. so massive. It's my all-time favorite library. I mean, I've never been in huh. libraries in another country, but like, yeah, me which would probably be amazing because yeah. they're so old. But, mm-hmm. um, oh, such a cool library. All right. Well, let's find out what's going on okay, at this library. It. Let's get started on this tale of a college kid uh, with a, a title of a story called The Lost Musician. Okay. To the king and queen of spooks, scares, and sarcasm. Good morning, kids. I've been a longtime fan since the beginning back in 2016 oh, when wow. my brother introduced me to Time Suck. We've been avid listeners ever since. <laughs> You've helped us survive many a long road trip. And lately, I've been listening possibly too much. Do you have <laughs> any idea what it's like to wake up in the morning and go to get ready and just hit play on your phone to suddenly have Dan yelling, fuck me in the ass in your ears <laughs> sincerely your sanity i hope that is not how you uh, sincerely for your sanity i hope that is not how your daily lives go <laughs> but honestly with you two i wouldn't be shocked but with all that with, oh, but with all this listening i finally decided it's time to send in my own story now on to the tale of the lost musician I've always considered myself to be a ghost agnostic, mostly as a joke, but also because I don't know if we will ever come to a point where we can truly grasp and understand ghosts, their realm, and their connection to ours. It's a running joke with my friends who once dragged me off to a ghost town tour in Montana, of all places, where I remained staunchly skeptical despite the best efforts of the tour guide. In fact, I laughed outright when one of the members of the group excitedly showed me a picture he had taken of a house where in the window he claimed to see the face of a child looking back mm-hmm. at him. Looking at this photo and knowing where I had been standing in the dark that night with a hat and a dark jacket on, I knew my own face looking back at me in the reflection when I saw it. That being said, I still want to tell you about what happened at work this past summer. I work at a prominent Christian university library nestled in the Rocky Mountains. We house the largest collection of viola music on the West Coast (laughs) in a special section of our collection donated by an incredible viola player after his death. This collection is housed in the care of our department, and throughout the day, and especially at night, we make sure that the area is clean, secure, and locked with the lights out to prevent light damage in the collection. And this section of the library has long known to be haunted. I didn't believe it at first. Certainly, this collection has the air of something much older than the rest of our library. Dark wood paneled walls, antique furniture, tucked away in a forgotten corner of the library, holding more than six million items. It's very dark and every academia nerd's dream. But the vibe. The vibe is what's weird. For starters, the room was always a solid 10 degrees colder than the rest of the library. And the custodial department insisted that the circulation to the room from our heating vents was just fine. Then there were the chairs. I frequently worked, uh, I I worked frequently as I'm trying to put myself through school without taking on any student loans, and I guarantee that one too many time those chairs were in different places when I opened in the morning than where I had left them the night before at closing. This still wasn't enough, however, to convince me. I was more than happy to intentionally find excuses to not believe in what I was seeing. That was until one night when I was closing by myself. It started out so painfully normal, I still sometimes have a hard time believing it. It was the middle of summer in a university library, and I guarantee there are cemeteries more lively than my department that night. (laughs) I hadn't seen another soul in nearly three hours, and had been busy working on several graphic design templates for my department for a display on the research I'd been doing for nearly six months. Faintly, I could hear what sounded like violin music just on the edge of my hearing. I didn't think much of it. Our department head and music librarian had an office right next to our help desk and rather frequently would play classical music quietly while she worked. On a night such as this, when there wasn't a soul to be seen, it wasn't unusual for us to be able to hear it on the other side of the wall. So like I said, I didn't think much of it. The night wore on and finally, I went to go close up the viola archive and lock things down for the night. As I rounded the corner, the sound of the music increased in volume. 
strangely clear, as though I could hear every string creaking, and now what I realized was a viola. It stopped when I entered the archive. It was cold. Too cold for the scorching summer day that it had been. Immediately I wished for a jacket as I went about my duties, slowly shutting off the lights before locking the door behind me. Then I moved up to the harp archive to do the same thing. Now let me explain this. The harp archive is located just on the other side of the wall from the viola archive. This is a large set of double doors connecting the two rooms that are kept locked at all times. But the doors aren't set well, and there's a gap about an inch under the doors and a half-inch gap where they connect. Stepping into the harp archive, I glanced around and seeing it was unoccupied, simply hit the light to turn it off and lock up. I turned to do so, however, and suddenly I was struck by a glow that shouldn't have been there. Squinting, I could see that there was a light on in the viola archive, where I had just been, where I am certain I had turned off all the lights. It simply didn't make sense and I that I had skipped one. I'd been working this job for nearly three years, and the number one basic rule of document preservation was, and always will be, no light exposure. Mm -hmm. Weirded out, but not overly concerned, I walked a little closer to see which light was on. Then, as I got closer, it happened. Under the door frame, shadows shot out as someone or something took clear and deliberate steps in front of the door from the other side, pacing back and forth. The shadow moved as the figure walked, and then again, much more clearly now, I heard viola music. Distinctly, I got the feeling that I was witnessing something I wasn't supposed to see. But, I was, but I'm a curious kid, and if something was hiding out in the archive after hours, I wasn't going to be exactly thrilled. Peeking through the crack in the door, I could just make out the silhouette of a man in clothes, about a century out of date, pacing back and forth as he played the viola. It wasn't more than a glimpse, but it was enough for me. I'm not an idiot. Having done my civic duty and making sure it wasn't a student, it was clearly time for me to get the fuck out, and I was more than happy to do so. If the donor of the library's collection of viola music wanted to have a late-night practice session from beyond the grave, well, hey, I wasn't going to be the one to stop him. Whatever it was, it didn't feel malicious, but I never liked the idea of being attacked by something I couldn't fend off with my fists. I'm not an idiot, but in a pitch black room, I might be what you could consider not the most athletic. Backing up carefully, I ran into a shelf behind me. It hardly made a sound, but I immediately noticed the light in the room winked out. A cold wind blasted through the cracks in the door and I ducked, trying to make myself mm. smaller in the dark room. A heartbeat passed. And then another. And then just as I was working up the courage to run, boom, something slammed into the door on the far side. The hinges are set up so the door would swing in towards me and it was unlocked and I watched the door bend inwards before snapping back out. That was enough. I bolted and I never looked back. I don't have enough time to deal with a haunting in my life right now. I still work at the same library and I utterly refuse to close the archive alone at night. They don't pay me nearly <laughs> enough for that. Cheers, CM. That's interesting about the door kind of like bending a little bit. Mm-hmm. And uh, that setting, uh, I, I kept flashing on, I think it's the original Ghostbusters movie, like the 1984, very first one. Uh, the first ghost that the crew goes after is a librarian. I'm 99% certain. The like movie came out in 1984 mm -hmm. when I was one? <laughs> yeah, the first oh. Ghostbusters. Oh, I felt like it came out when I was a kid. Mm -mm. Wow. I mean, I believe you. You have a weird memory. Um but yeah, but like, uh, yeah, but there's like, I, I can picture like the apparition. She like looked like an older lady. Mm -hmm. She's like, you know, working on the books or whatever like that. Was she like the librarian? Uh, I can't remember like when they caught her, if she was like the former librarian, probably, probably. but then like became like this crazy monster, like when agitated, but, uh, that movie scared me. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. Like, you know, when you see it when you're a little kid, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, Slimer, you know, he Aww. was the comic relief, but there were some other spirits that were not as uh, friendly. No, they were not kind. <laughs> um, yeah, but that's a great setting. Now, now I'm just trying to think, like, uh, in specifically, like, true horror movies, if I've seen one set in a library, but what a great place. Because it's like, you know, a lot of times the lights are a little dimmer in parts mm -hmm. of it. Because, and especially, and I know, like, you're talking about the viola section at Foley. I can't remember what it was called, but on the 
top floor, I think it was the fourth floor, but on the top floor, you couldn't just go there. There was one section of rare <laughs> books that you had to get permission to go there. Right. Probably you know, have to put on gloves. The do- you have yeah. to be let in. Mm-hmm. Yada, yada, yada. Not, not anybody could even look at them if they wanted to. Right. I'm sure you know, there was, there was – because I, I never actually went up there and working there – uh, that wasn't the area I worked in, so I never. I just knew about it and was fascinated. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Like, like in glass cases, mm-hmm. and you do have to be really careful about like you know, um, airflow and light. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, just uh, like a museum. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so that so those rooms are going to be you know are going to be darker, and just like yeah, what a what a spooky place. It's just inherently already a spooky place. I know, I know, and I love like that. Well, when you were sorry. When you were talking about like movies set there, I'm like, oh, well, normally a library I feel like is actually in like an action film when like someone's chasing after someone because it's quiet and it's dim and you can hide behind all these different things. But Mm -hmm. I cannot think of a horror movie that takes place. I'm sure it exists. Yeah. I'm sure I'm just like blanking on it. But yeah. Because there's so many, because with all the shelves, there's so many visual obstructions. Mm -hmm, Exactly. And And, like pulling the books back and like mm -hmm. seeing something on the other side. And And you're used to seeing glimpses of people. Right. Because you see them through the the space between the top of the book and the next shelf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, or you see them walk by the end of the shelf. I'm thinking of you now. That's uh, so funny. I made that note. Okay. At the very beginning when I was writing this out, I was saying that like it makes me think of Joe in the library who worked in and you. Right, right. In the third season, I think. Yeah, whatever this most recent season is. Right. If you haven't watched that yeah series i think it's on netflix um but yeah yeah it's a great place for true crime or for uh the paranormal you know the paranormal it's a great great place yeah because like like if i'm at a a library and i not that it happened in this story not that there was like an apparition it was more like a light and sound and then like you know air that cold air well they saw he saw she or he or she i don't know saw footsteps under the door and they did see a shadow oh okay that's right that's right so that so that's a yeah i was thinking of like seeing like an entity walk past right right because if you did um you know it's like initially i would just assume that that was somebody Somebody else else. absolutely uh because that stuff happens all the time yep oh man mm-hmm. needs to be get get going uh i know we have some hollywood uh people listening to this podcast right that Just, movie you know i know it's super easy well, to well write a movie. This arm it could be <laughs> your number one work. prop yeah what are you what are you waiting for yeah like you know Come on, just yeah. get a crew together, Let's go. get your funding, <laughs> get distribution approved. It's so easy. It's so easy, you guys. Anybody can do it. <laughs> uh, okay. Do you remember, like, I think with, like maybe right when we started this podcast a couple years ago, uh, I was talking about a podcast called, I think it's Two Girls and a Ghost. And it was, I don't even know if we talked about it on air, but I told yeah, you about it at home. I think home, you did talk about it on air. Where it was like, they told the story of somebody... I don't think it was one of them. It doesn't matter. Somebody went to like a Goodwill kind of thrift store, mm. got a desk chair. I think you were talking about it on air. Yeah. Yeah, it was wild. Where it's like they got this desk chair, they brought it to their house, and then they lived in a house with multiple people and things kept happening and the chair would kind of like spin around on its own and it was weird and they got rid of it. They like took it back to Goodwill or mm-hmm, mm-hmm. equivalent. And then from their apartment, they could see like across to another apartment. And within weeks, if not months, uh, the neighbors across brought home the exact same chair and then they would see that chair sort of like spinning towards their room. Uh, It was very weird. And that person who bought that chair then went on a trip with like, I guess before the neighbors bought it, before they got rid of it, Mm -hmm. had gone on a trip to like Vietnam or something. Like that was like their their parents' home country and they'd gone there and they were in a store and some random person comes up to them and is like, there is something attached to you. And I just remember that story freaked me out so much that I was like, I was already afraid to buy vintage antique things i get like i love the idea of it but it scares me Mm -hmm. because of things like that and that this story took me right back to that like shit you do not buy things that you don't know where it came from or the history of that item yeah yeah right i mean i mean i I mean still think that it's going to be super rare that you're going to have something i mean there's a lot of cool antiques out there but but yeah that's a a small risk i don't know maybe it's why your mom's house feels uncomfortable she has some weird stuff that she buys at antique stores (laughs) she does yeah, I'm not even going to bring up some of the weird stuff she has that is... Uh, Culturally uh, inappropriate? That's exactly the term that popped into my head uh-huh. that we don't even need to get into here. Oh, my God. But she's so... Um, she doesn't mean, she does, I mean, this is what a lot of people say. She doesn't mean anything by it, but it is true. Well, she is just like... <laughs> to, I love your mom, but like country bumpkin. You know what I mean? Yes. She just like lives in the middle of nowhere yeah. and she doesn't read the news and like... Yeah, sure, she has the internet to play Candy Crush. Like, you know, but I love her. I love your mom so much. But it's like, she, if now if you told her, mm-hmm. she would be so upset. Right. She she would be embarrassed. And I mm-hmm. don't even know that the items would go away. <laughs> but it's like, right. I mean, just like, 
just to like clarify it, it's like, you know, an old Uncle Ben's rice tin. Mm-hmm. You know, that just like is in her cabinet. She's not thinking anything of that. She's still going to Costco, buying a new bag of rice and just filling it back up. Mm-hmm. And she just thinks like, oh, that's the storage container I've had for 30 years. I'm just going to keep using it. Yeah. 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 Anyways, we should probably talk to her. Kyler's always like, I think we should have a talk with grandma. <laughs> I'm like, go ahead, buddy. You go uh, for yeah, it. Yeah, you go for that. You make her cry. Oh, yeah. I know she'd be so sad. Mm-hmm. Okay. So anyways, on to the story. Uh the the t- the name of this tale, the title of this tale, I love this. The thing that stole my brother's face. Oh, that is a good one. I know. I was like, okay, way to go. Hey, queen and king. I've been a fan of Scared to Death and Dance Comedy for a while now. I love all three podcasts, but this for sure is my number one favorite. Oh, that's nice. Sorry, Nimrod. <laughs> Anyways, I've been hesitant on sharing this story because it meant revisiting my experience in detail, which I usually avoid. However, after having a long talk with my therapist, he advised that it would be good for me to write it out, even Mm. if I never shared it with anyone else. And he was right. And so I finally decided that it would be okay to share it with you guys because, well, it's you guys. And I know that if it makes it onto the show, I can trust this community with the small part of my life. True. That's nice. I often get teased by my coworkers for not wanting to thrift shop with them. Most of them do weekly runs to see if they can find trendy clothes for their kids and a nice, cheap piece of accent furniture. They compare their thrifty finds over coffee breaks, of which I purposely exclude myself from. They have invited me countless times to come along to Goodwill, a few blocks away from work, and I always offer the same excuse. I don't think I'll find anything I'd want to bring home with me. Some of them have even asked me if I think shopping secondhand, shopping for secondhand goods is beneath me, and the answer is no. On the contrary, I love a good Barton. I really wish I could be comfortable buying clothes or a piece of furniture that once belonged to someone else. And I don't think they would be comfortable either if they had had the experience I had 18 years ago. There was this cute antique shop by my house in Hollywood, Florida, that I used to visit all the time. Even though I never bought anything, I liked to browse. And Marla, the owner, loved to tell me stories behind the objects. I'm not sure how many of those stories were true since she had an incredible tale for every item, no matter how small and ordinary. One afternoon, she had a big delivery while I was at the store. Apparently, some wealthy homeowners had decided to sell their house and everything in it. Marla asked me if I could help her set up the new items in the front of the store. I'll give you a discount if you see anything you like, she said jokingly, while handing me a box with the words throw blanket written on it. I agreed with a grunt placed the box on the ground and behind the register and began moving things around the store. The delivered furniture wasn't new by any means, but it definitely looked expensive and of good taste. What caught my eye was a Victorian looking vanity with a small bench under it and a huge mirror on top. The vanity was dark brown with gold accents and fancy birdcage knobs. And although it had some scuffs, it still looked marvelous. The best part was that it matched my bed frame and end tables to a T. So, after much negotiating, Marla sold it to me for $50 and the promise that I would help with the next big delivery she got. I spent all my savings buying it, but it was worth it. As I suspected, the vanity looked perfect in my bedroom. The mirror was big enough that I could do my makeup in it up close and also check out my outfit when I stepped back. The (laughs) small bench was comfortable to sit on and it was the perfect height too. Looking back now, I'd pay all the money I had and more to have never have brought that thing into my life. The morning after started like any other day. I made my bed, brushed my teeth, and sat down at my new vanity to do my makeup. I was putting on some cheap, teenager good enough foundation when I saw something in the mirror. A shadow, close to the wall behind me, and I immediately turned around to find nothing. I chuckled and turned back around again. And then as I was putting on mascara, I saw something behind me again, and I almost stabbed my eye out with the mascara wand. This time, I fought the urge to turn around. I put the mascara down and looked intensely at the shadowy shape behind me. I could see its edges move, an emotion that reminded me of whatever's inside a lava lamp. I saw a human body start to form, then a face. My throat nodded and my stomach sank as I saw the misty eyes meet mine in the mirror's reflection. It was the face of my deceased brother. Whoa. Michael, my older and only brother, passed away suddenly when I was a young girl. He'd been been involved in a fatal car accident. His passing had devastated our family. He was so young and so full of life, a true kind soul taken far too soon from this world. I kept my eyes locked on his face. My brain was scrambling to make sense of it. And then suddenly my bedroom door flung open and one of my sisters came barging in asking to borrow something. After one look at my face, she asked me if I was okay. No, I said. 
I think I just saw Michael. He was standing behind me. And of course she didn't believe me. I don't think I would have either if the roles were reversed. That night, after I came home from school, I sat and stared at the mirror for a long time, but nothing happened. The next morning, though, as I was putting on makeup, I saw the shape, and once again, it had my brother's face. I was thinking of all the things you're supposed to feel when you're in the presence of a spirit or something like that, but the air didn't change, and I didn't feel anything off in my room or any bad energy coming from this thing. The more I looked at it, the more I convinced myself that maybe it was my brother. Maybe he just wanted to say goodbye, since we'd never had the chance before he passed. And so I began talking to it like I would have talked to my brother. And every morning, I would wake up excited to, to talk to him once more. My parents and sisters questioned who I was talking to, and when I responded that I was chatting with Michael, they said, oh, that's sweet. You tell him we said hi. Hmm. This went on for weeks. I told him even on the days, I, I would see him even on the days I was running late, and I only had time to catch a glimpse of him in the mirror. Then after about a month or so, things started to take a bad turn. I would get sick for a few days, a lot of coughing, a fever, and then the symptoms would go away for a few days, and then they would come back again. For a, while, for, a, for a bit, my parents thought I was faking it and that I just wanted to skip school. Finally, they took me to the doctor after the symptoms didn't go away for a whole week and I was diagnosed with the flu. They gave me some medication and did some blood work and after the results came back normal, but I was still sick, my parents doubled down on me faking the whole thing. They contacted my school to see if I was having any issues that would have made me want to avoid going in, but I was actually a good student and had no problems with my classmates. Meanwhile, my health continued to get worse to the point that I would rarely leave the house. The highlight of my days became talking to Michael every morning. Four months had passed when my mom decided that we should pay a visit to the nearby church. You know, saying a quick prayer wouldn't hurt, she said. To this, I opened my eyes as wide as I could. My family had never been the church type, and none of us were even baptized. My mom especially didn't like talking about religion. She had said no God would take a child away from her mother's arms so soon and I couldn't disagree with her. As soon as we walked in the church, I immediately started to feel better, like I could take a full breath of air again. We all sat down in one of the pews. My parents bowed their heads and began praying. I didn't really know what to do, so I kind of just sat there, looking around, trying not to make contact, contact with the other churchgoers. I must have looked like a fish out of water because one of the priests immediately came over to me and politely requested to sit next to me. After a few moments, he asked me the purpose of my visit. I said I wasn't sure. I told him I'd been sick for a while and the doctors hadn't got a clue, so my mom thought we could pray. He smiled and asked if I'd ever prayed before. I shook my head and then he offered to guide me on a few prayers and I obliged, repeating the words after him. When we were done, he smiled, patted my head, and headed towards my parents. Once I found myself alone, I bowed my head one more time and clasped my hands hard. I remember praying to my brother Michael to help me get better, saying, please, Michael, help me, Michael, over and over until I heard my mom call my name. That night, as I was brushing my hair and getting ready for bed, I almost jumped out of the small bench I was sitting on. Behind me was Michael. I had never seen him at night, so I wasn't expecting him. This time, he came closer to me. And now he was just a few feet away, and I could see the face and the glossy eyes clearer. His face looked enraged, and his mouth was moving fast, almost like it was glitching. A feeling of dread washed over me, and for the first time I realized this thing was not my brother. The air started to feel heavy and my breath slowed. I felt like I had a piece of bread stuck in my throat. My body started shivering uncontrollably, even though I was not at all cold. And then it started to move slowly, creeping in closer, until its face was almost next to my own. My eyes fixated on the mirror. I didn't want to look behind me and find if this thing was real. I was so terrified I started crying, whispering Michael's name over and over, pleading for his help. And then I saw a hand grab the face and pull it back, hard. I thought someone had come to help me. My mom? My dad? One of my sisters? I turned around fast, but there was no one there. And then I heard a loud noise behind me, and it came from the mirror. Somehow, it had cracked, like the shape of it had been struck by lightning. My room was silent, and the air suddenly felt normal again. I crawled into bed, still shaking, hoping that this thing was gone for good. The next morning, I asked my dad to help me throw away the vanity. I told him I had leaned on it and cracked it. Since the vanity was big, we broke it into pieces to make it fit in the trash. I'm happy to report my life went back to normal and that that night was the last time I ever saw the shadowy shape that stole my brother's face. But the story doesn't end there. Fast forward a few weeks later, I came by Marla's shop and casually asked her if I could have any information regarding the previous owners of the vanity. When she asked why, I told her I'd found a few personal effects in one of the drawers and wanted to ask if maybe they had wanted them back. 
She gave me a name and a phone number. Hello? A woman's voice spoke from the other end of the line. Hi, yes, I'm, I'm sorry to bother you, ma'am. Uh, I got your phone number from the shop to which you sold some of your furniture to a few months ago. Yes, what is this about? She asked in a bothered tone. Well, I purchased one of the items and was wondering if you could tell me more about it. Like, maybe it's value? Uh, I'm planning to resell it, and, you know, I was trying to sound as convincing as I could. Which item are you referring to? She said. The brown vanity with the big mirror, ma'am. The phone went silent for a second, but I could hear her breathing. Ma'am? Ma'am, are you still there? I'm sorry. I should have burned that thing when I had the chance. And she hung up. Now you understand my fear of buying something that's been previously owned. I'm even more scared of buying a house that's not built, not new built, fearing it'll have something attached to it. Funnily enough, though, I'm not actually scared of mirrors. Anyways, thanks for reading, and remember to check for demons when you guys buy thrifted items. Oh a God. fellow creeper and peeper, Blue. Yeek. Right? That's a good one. Really good. That's such a weird phenomena like like i just you know always think like the longer the show goes on i just like you know like trends you know the literary i guess it's called tropes or whatever but like it, it, it is interesting that um people who you know claim to also like oftentimes be unfamiliar with like the horror genre or whatever mm -hmm. will have some experience and then the story they tell ends up kind of like falling into this category of a lot of stories with similar characteristics mm -hmm. and that whole like demonic attachment thing what a terrifying thing where, you know, like these entities will behave in similar ways. And the biggest one is like manipulation. Right. Starts benign, approaches you with the, you know, often like preys on grief mm -hmm. or, you know, loss and, you know, approaches you with the voice or the appearance of a, a deceased loved one. Oh, and, my God. And then, and then like gets you to like, that's a common thing. Like they start talking to it and, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, feel they like build oh, a rapport with it. Mm -hmm, it's fine. A rapport. It's my oh, brother. This is fine. That, yeah, the house is haunted, but it's nothing to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a, a nice spirit right and then it starts to like they get like you know physical illness is common uh -huh. and things like like it's Exhaustion. feeding on them uh -huh. it's like sucking you dry parasitical kind of entity that's fucking terrifying and, and then like you know when you try to get rid of it when you try to like break the attachment turns you know uh, malevolent mm -hmm. and malicious it's like yee that is fucking creepy and scary i know mm -hmm. i know and that's why like you know, oftentimes people say, even if you think it's good, you mm -hmm. have to, I mean, we've talked about this. There have been feelings, vibes, energy in our house, both good and bad. And no matter what, I'm always asking it to leave because the fear mm -hmm. is that it may feel good now, but it might not feel good later. How terrifying if that is true, that there are these entities in some dimension, you know, outside of ours, perhaps like overlaid on top of ours that like are looking for little windows into this world mm -hmm. and, and they want to like manipulate and uh, you know, like yeah. not outright just like push you down the stairs no. or something. They want slow. a slow burn, yep. a slowly like pull you into madness or slowly pull you into just, you know, misery. It feels like they're smarter than we give them credit for. Yeah. Well, Which leads me to, these okay, are. Joe Paisley, let's just talk about this. Last night, Joe wasn't feeling great. And I just wonder, like, there is something in your house, like, is it trying to get your attention? Like, are you actually not feeling well or is your little friend trying to get you? It was friends, plural, mm -hmm. little spirit children. Joe, I mean, I was in the kitchen again. So we'll see? 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 Maybe I get that thing, get rid of that thing. I mean, maybe like your heart started like going crazy last night because... Mm -hmm. The, your your spirit friends are trying to, to attach to you or you haven't given them enough attention. Like, maybe you guys should, like, do some smoke cleansing maybe, tonight. Maybe, Talk to Aaron. Maybe Monique was wrong. Maybe they're not, like, harmless little kid entities. Maybe they're uh, appearing that way. Oh, my God. Thanks, guys. You're welcome. <laughs> Yee. Any, well, anything else that's going on? <laughs> <laughs> I just, Joe, listen, I just think, like, cleanse the house tonight. You know how to do it. Aaron knows how to do it. And just, like, you know, maybe put, like, some black tourmaline in your kitchen. I keep it in our kitchen. Uh... It's just like just saying. Okay, I'll give it a go. Okay, I'd, I'd rather do that than die. So <laughs> oh we'll go God. with that. I mean, it could also be long COVID, but like, let's let's be realistic. It's probably a ghost. Oh, jeez, let's be realistic. It's probably a ghost. That's like <laughs> that's like a great quote. Let's be realistic. It's probably a ghost. That's a great quote. <laughs> could we get that on a T-shirt? <laughs> do you know a guy? Yeah, yeah. I think we could find a guy. We can find a guy. Do you want to do some Annabelle shoutouts? Yeah. Do you want me to do them first, or you? Uh, I'll go first. Sure. Okay. I would like to thank the following Annabelles for supporting us on Patreon, making our donations and our scholarship fund possible. Daniela Rios, Michelle Davis, uh, Brinley Grace Michelle, Annie North, Leslie Garcia, Pterodactyl, good one, Nick Raharby, Chance Hansen, Sunny Yancey, Sam Crisp, Tom Kessler, 
Tina Berry, Krista Del Fosse, Josie Morgan, Nathan Newman, Crystal Roberts, Cassie Risberg, Addie Aguilar, Sandy Segovia, Lewis Herbert, Valerie Morales, Your Worst Nightmare, hmm. <laughs> birth name, Jared Fallenesby, Nikita Gabde- ooh, Gabdeyev, Linda Montano, Christopher Guilford, Marcy Ru- Ru- Ruiz, and Allie Clark. I would like to also uh, thank the following Annabelles. Uh, Space Kitten 101, birth name I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jennifer Valdez, Noah Fitzpatrick, Brianna, a.k.a. Pandy. And there was an exclamation point there. So I got a <laughs> Pandy is very cute. Um, April Loving, Kylie Kaluza, Donna Orlando. <laughs> Somebody, uh, you know, uh, signed up for this level of patronage for this joke, I'm certain. Pooh stain butt sweat. Gross. <laughs> I, hear, I hear Logan laughing. That's so, my favorite when all of a sudden I just hear a burst of Logan. Uh-huh. Someone someone is happy that they that name made it onto the show. Uh, Heather Rios, Jenny Osland, Gianna Valdemar, uh, Thomas Harden, or Valdemar, uh, Crystal H, Jonathan Smith, April Penny, Kelly Joe, Alex Flowers, Rachel, Patricia Guido, Jenny Nelson, Morgan Drake, Rudy and Ebony, either uh, Villarreal or Villarreal, Ressa Jessup, um, Bobby Biskey. There's, there's miss, it's missing a vowel, but which could be intentional. It, yeah, it's intentional because I looked it up because I was like, oh, did I misspell that? Nope. Okay, like Icelandic, some kind of Norse name B- or something. Biskey. Perhaps. Bobby Biskey uh, and Jasmine Stewart. Good job. And I have the following spoopy shoutouts now. And now I don't know if this is Alexis or Alexic. I should have asked you how to pronounce your name, but to Joseph from Alexic, happy birthday, happy anniversary, and I love you. To Brandon from Mackenzie, happy belated birthday. <laughs> to Barbie from Kendra, happy birthday. To Ashley from Stephanie, thanks for being amazing. To Bobby Q from your daughter, Becca, thanks for being such a supportive dad. To Megan from Jocelyn, you're a badass, and I can't imagine my life without you. Aww. And to Lauren from Randy, happy birthday. That's awesome. Uh, that is our show. Thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else at info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks to Logan Keith and Liz Hernandez for their work on social media and to Logan again for running badmagicmerch.com. Thanks to Joe Paisley for producing and directing today. Zach Cohen for custom soundbed creation. Heather Rylander for organizing the my story emails. And to our book editor, Drew Atana, for helping format the listener stories you hear each week. Thanks to producer Sophie Evans for finding today's first story, and uh, thanks to Sarah Finch and Olivia Lee, both worked on the second one. Enjoy your nightmares, creeps, and peepers. Do not be a Darren, (laughs) and hope you were scared to death. Bye! If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but has no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions. 